So let's start off by imagining a wearable on your skin. It looks like a band-aid, but it's integrated with electronics, which are capable of measuring and communicating your health vitals. This could be your skin temperature, ECG, or your oxygen levels. It allows you to live your life wire-free, while still offering you the peace of mind that an intervention is possible when those vitals drop to levels of concern. Now, these devices don't always have to be on your skin. They could actually be in the environment around you. You may not feel it, and this is what we call a neurable. So imagine a neurable now on a mattress on which you sleep every night, and it's able to pick up your presence, position, and posture in bed. Now, this is critical information for residents in aged care homes where the, in, to enhance the quality of the care and to prevent falls, which is the number one concern in these aged care homes. You don't need to imagine these anymore now. The future is actually here right now. So what I actually described are two of the technologies developed in the lab at RMIT University where I work, and these are actually undergoing field trials right now. So what started as a fundamental research for me back in 2012 in a lab at RMIT University. And what I'm gonna do is take you through that decade-long journey of commercialization of how we managed to bring this technology out from the lab into real life through collaborations. Now, I'm an electronics engineering professor and an innovator, and I do research in what are called clean rooms at RMIT University. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the word clean rooms, but true to the word, they are rooms which are very, very, very clean. <laughs> Basically, the air in this is filtered stringently to remove any form of contamination. We wear bunny suits in these clean rooms and protective equipment, not because the lab is dangerous, but because we are the biggest contaminant in these labs. The electronics which we make in these labs are micro and nano sized, and so a single eyelash or oil from your skin can actually destroy thousands of devices. And it's in a clean room like this where my vision to create the next generation of electronics which are thin and flexible was actually realized. Now, as a research project, we had to overcome numerous materials challenges to take smart technology like your, tele like your phones or your tablets and render them on a platform which is like a contact lens type material. So take the breakable and try and make it unbreakable. So think thin, soft, flexible, and pliable technologies. It took us three years to get there to take brittle layers of fantastic functional materials, which are usually glass-like in nature, and render them soft and pliable. At the end of that journey, we were really, really excited, and we had thought we opened up a world of possibilities. Now, what could this do for you? In other words, what can't this do for you? It can sense environmental dangers, so UV levels, pollutants, dangerous gases. Or you can sense your own health parameters, your saliva, your sweat, your tears. All of this has vital information about yourself. So where can we go next? What started after that was an initially very optimistic, but slowly turned into a quite frustrating journey of endless industry meetings and conversations. In my head, I imagine this technology making its way out into the world as a wearable, which can sense the world around you and also sense the world within you. But after three years, I met the CEO of Sleep Tight. Now, Sleep Tight is a company which is actually looking at revolutionizing the world of sleep. Cameron, their CEO, had valuable insights into the world of residential aged care homes, where currently the monitoring is being done during the course of the night by door-to-door by door -door early checks. So essentially what that means is every hour, all through the night, a person is coming in and checking in on the resident in the aged care home. Now this will disrupt their sleep all through the night. It's the most inefficient way to use a carer's time and energy, and it does not allow them to offer care where it's most needed during the course of the night. Now Cam wanted to know if we can take our clean room developed micro and nanotech and actually translate them into mattress size, warehouse manufactured tech to, for better health and for better sleep and for better care. One thing my numerous conversations in those past three years has taught me is I need to be flexible, just like my technology in some ways. I was keen that this technology goes in the way of market pull and market need. What followed after that was again a fascinating journey of commercialization and collaboration, not just between research and industry, but also the manufacturing partner Sleep Easy. We created our nearable technology, Remy, which I described earlier, and this was actually launched last year. 
It was again a three-year journey. I have something to do with the number three, I think. Most of my journeys are three years. But this journey required us to innovate very, very differently. We had to start all over from the beginning because there's a different set of priorities. Now, in the world of commercialization, what matters is cost, reliability, and mass manufacturability. So we had to rethink our designs, we had to rethink our materials, and also rethink the user interactions. Learning to make prototypes in a mattress manufacturing unit, no, that's a very different experience. No more are we in bunny suits, no more are we using tweezers to handle our samples. We are actually screen printing sensors onto mattress protectors. Testing these, that was a very different experience as well. We usually take our samples very delicately and place them on testing stages. We use rollator machines. This is pretty similar to the machines which are used to lay down cricket pitches, for instance. And we actually use that to test the durability of the sensors. Now, a critical element which remains in front of our mind as we commercialize our technology is mainly the user interaction. How will a user actually interact with these technologies? A 20-year-old will interact with a wearable very differently to a 70-year-old. Form factor, packaging, understanding what the sensor is trying to tell you, changing batteries, all these are user interaction points which can make or break your decision to continue using that particular wearable. We also have phenomenal collaborators in design who I have to call out and who we collaborate with and they give us these valuable insights all the time. Our vision is that wearables are a piece of art which each one would love to wear and also love to use. Now that brings me to my final piece of my story which is diversity in technology. There are a lot of reports recently on how we live in a world which is designed for men. So right from male crash test dummies to ill-fitting protective equipment, to military equipment, to misdiagnosing heart attack attack symptoms in women, or even autism in women, we live in a world designed for men, predominantly by men. It's baffling to think that we're misdesigning for genders which represent over half of the world's population. But then when you think about it, most decisions are made by people sitting around a table. And if the people sitting around the table do not reflect the diversity of your target audience, chances are your innovation will not be made to match that audience either. There are some rare examples of where people with lived experience are making technology or products to suit themselves. There are pencil sharpeners, for instance, for left-handed people. Or Crayola introduced a big bunch of color pencils so that kids can actually draw skin tones to depict realistic people. But these are very few and they are far in between. So as a technologist, how can I set this right going forward? I'll again give you two examples in this particular case, and I'm gonna go back to the Remy example. So in the case of Remy, when I go and present my work in say Asia, where we're talking about putting sensors in mattresses and doing non-invasive monitoring of residents in an aged care home, I usually get two very different reactions. One is from a section of the Asian audience where usually people choose to age at home. And it's the responsibility of younger populations such as myself to actually care for the aging population. Now, for people like them, we actually want this information available in the form of an app. So I can check in on my mom or dad's quality of sleep during the course of the night. And that's one of the things which we are working on. So it's not just about a dashboard for carers in homes. It's also about having an app version for the same thing. The other reaction I get from Asia is, this is too complicated. Why don't you just put a camera in the room? You'll get all the information which you ever need about the person's safety. Privacy and safety are two very different things, and I guess the balance between the two is a very, very cultural lens to the whole thing. So as you can clearly see, aging is something which has a cultural lens to it, and so aged care and the technology which we develop for that also has to take that into account. My second example, we recently had a project where we had to develop ultraviolet light sensors, or UV sensors, as you call them. Now, we live in the land of skin cancer, and these particular patches are actually worn on your skin, and they change color to kind of give you the warning that you've had too much UV exposure for the particular day. Now, we all know UV causes skin damage, but then we also need UV to produce vitamin D in the skin. And most importantly, the amount of UV, which either causes damage or is required for vitamin D production, it changes based on skin type. So if you take someone like me, I actually need much more UV to produce vitamin D or to cause skin damage. So when we had to do this, we took one look at the table, and thankfully, I co-lead a diverse group, and we looked around the table and we realized we at least have four different skin types between us. So we didn't design one sensor, we designed six sensors for six different skin types. And again, this is an example of where one size or one technology does not fit all. So as a technologist, 
I would love to see a world where technology can be customized. And by customized, I don't mean just changing the color or changing the finish. I actually mean taking it into account diversity in all its forms, be it age, culture, gender, or beyond. Thank you.